Um, well, Molly, why won't the rest of the EU guarantee that our citizens can stay uh, when we leave uh, the EU? Well, I think that's a really good question. I think it's incredibly sad to see somebody like Wojtek there really saying that he now feels unwelcome and he's wondering who in the playground doesn't want him and his children to be there. That's a really sad outcome from the whole Brexit debate and the referendum. But to answer your question, I think this is a real opportunity that's been missed here because if we'd gone in at the beginning and said, well, OK, we've decided to leave, but we're going to protect all EU citizens who are already here and all their rights, then the European countries would probably have responded in kind. And all but this we've made it pretty clear. I mean, all the statements from avoided. government have said we're just waiting on the reciprocal arrangement. I know. So but the, why aren't they? I mean, it's so them playing hardball, no, not the government. No, because we've made the change. We've said we're going to change the conditions, so we should have made a, a firm offer at the beginning to protect all EU citizens here. And then the same offer would have come back. That was very clear. And it was Theresa May's... It was clear, was it? Yeah. So you had those assurances that they would? It, it was clear from that side. And I think Theresa okay. May's statement that those people were going to be bargaining chips caused a lot of disappointment she, at the well, European she side. Well, she didn't say that. But, I mean, but they're actually, but, they're not sure about the exact words, but they are bargaining chips at the moment. Well, no, I mean, the, the Prime Minister's made it clear this is the absolute priority there is a uh, we are expecting this to be resolved as quickly as possible we, we wish it had been resolved by now why not make a big generous offer now just saying look of course well, we we're are. not going to be sending people the home. prime minister couldn't They're be welcome. any more public in her uh, intentions on this and we just need the reciprocal deals to come back it's a question now crossing the t's dotting the i's we wish it could have been done sooner it's the absolute priority it was set out clearly in the white paper and it's an important thing as part of these see, negotiations going forward you see we were told weren't we that um all these negotiations will be relatively easy now that's the first step actually just guaranteeing that brits and spain don't have to come home and so on uh, even that can't be resolved uh, it's not going to be easy the eu is going to be playing hardball well, there's going to be ups and downs, and we'll play hardball as well. And I'm grateful that in the Prime Minister we've got someone who's very strong when it so comes to negotiations. So would you play hardball on this issue? We don't need to play hardball because there is consensus from, our, from us, the government, and also from our European friends. It is just a question of now of organising all of the relevant paperwork and rules to make sure this is put in place. This is not going to be something that's contentious. There will be, there will be elements that will be but challenged. But the people on our film thought it was mm -hmm. contentious. Well, th they shouldn't do, because there is a will from our government, there's a will from our European neighbours and friends to have this resolved, and rightly so. Uh, we wish it had been done by now, and on this, on, on this one, it hasn't yet. But remember, okay, the, the well, overall negotiations are to take place over two years. This is something we're trying so to do. So even more uncertainty for them. I well, think this, all yes. this chat about hardball and you know tough negotiation and upping the ante, it's really unhelpful. It's actually economically damaging as well now. I mean, I, I heard today from Bournemouth that there's a big drop off in terms of people applying to language school. We're seeing the same with foreign students coming to our universities. There's a sense of people not being welcome. And that's really economically damaging because some of our most important service exports are, in fact, in the on, field of on, education. On the other hand, Molly, um, people voted to leave and immigration was undoubtedly a big issue in that decision. Uh, a lot of people feel they, there are too many immigrants here. OK, they so the fewer. question of immigration is very confused and very complicated. We're not actually talking about immigration as such here. We're talking about freedom of movement. It's a reciprocal right. So European people can come here and we can go to their, their countries. So it benefited both of us. And I think that's what we need to protect, that British people, especially British young people, can still travel and study and work abroad. Yeah, but let's, let's look at the, this is the government white paper which I've been, been studying. So take, for example, Poland. Uh, according to the government, there are 900,000, about a million Poles here. But when you look over the page to see how number, many Brits there are in Poland, it's probably a couple of hundred, a well, thousand or so. That's not so why would you want to guarantee their rights? Because uh, we're, we're, but, it's not a direct transfer like that. So British people often retire to Spain and France. They're not necessarily going to Poland, whereas Polish bricklayers may want to come here. But I think the important point is that these discussions are already happening at the European level. Because actually there's problems caused in Poland if all their young, skilled people come here. And in the case of Lithuania, out of four million people, one million are actually living abroad now. And it's all the useful young people. So actually the Greens and Peasant Party won the election in Lithuania recently on this point about trying to bring young people home. But free, yes, free movement is going to be restricted, isn't it, when we leave? There's no doubt about that. Yes, well, if we're outside the single market, it will. But I, I still think it will be very economically damaging to leave the single market. And the question is, are people prepared to trade off the loss of their jobs, the loss of their income, higher prices against restricting immigration? And the surveys show they're not prepared to lose anything financially in order to restrict Just immigration. To, well, I mean, the, that's the doomsday scenario that lost the referendum last year. The reality is, since Brexit's taken place, our economy is the strongest growing of any of the major developed economies. The Bank of England yet again revised up uh, growth figures. 
figures. We have record employment in every single region of the country. We have a very clear sign that we're open for trade. And this isn't a new thing. It's not a new challenge. Two thirds of our expats live in other countries outside of the EU and we have arrangements with them. But rightly, we've got to make sure that the arrangements are reciprocal and that it's something that we will get done as quickly as possible. There's Molly, a genuine it, will to see this Is happen. there something to be said just because the, all the predictions about economic catastrophe, so far at least, appear to be wrong? Well, I think it's important to say that, that, nothing, that nothing's actually changed because we're still members of the EU. The big changes will come when we leave. The main change that's happened so far is that there's been a fall in the pound. We were at a farm today that was saying that's very difficult because they also produce um, goods and they have to import you know, ingredients and those are much more expensive. So there are already economic effects. OK, I expect we'll return to this topic again, don't you? Thank you.